But something happens there that changes that all those questions were at the front page of the news, so to speak, or maybe in the front seat of their life everywhere they go, that something happens that those questions move around to the back of the car and they're put in the trunk. You say, how, how does that happen? Well, sometimes it has to do with relational crisis. I've seen this. I've seen husbands and wives. I mean, they just reach the point where it's, it's almost over. It's not worth staying together for. And all of a sudden, something happens there. And all those questions they had just seem to move, and they go to the back. I've seen this between children and parents, children and students. I mean, a lot of, a lot of pressure, a lot of tension on the front end. Something happens, and they move to the back. And you've got to ask yourself, what, why? And how could that happen? Then there are people here today that, Maybe it has to do with a financial crisis. And boy, we can relate to that in our economy today. People are losing their jobs, their benefits. They're losing their security. They're losing, you know, their 401ks. And all this is right up front. It's in the front seat of their life. But then something happens, and it moves to the back seat of their life or maybe to the trunk of their life. And you got what happens there? Because they've got a lot of questions about that. Then there could be others here today, and you're going through some kind of personal crisis. You know, it could be you're here, and, and you have an addiction problem. Maybe it's an STD, or maybe it's drugs. And, you know, your question is, could God ever, you know, forgive you, or could, could God ever do something with you? And, and that's at the front of your questions in life. And in your mind and your heart, you think, there's no way. There's no way I could ever get to God because of the questions that you have. I just want you to know it's okay to have questions. Billy Graham had questions. Pastor Ken still has questions. I think that's part of our humanity. But all of a sudden, something happens in our life, and, and all of a sudden you say, well, how does that happen? I'm going to give you two illustrations today that most of us can relate to before we get to the message. And, and let me use the first one for those of you that are here today and you're a mom and a dad, okay? Remember when you got married and you were thinking about having children, weren't sure of the timing, didn't know, whatever, and you had all those questions, remember? I don't know if we can afford it. It will have to move from our one-bed apartment to a three-story house. You know how that goes, I mean... We're going, you know, they got the college education. We, we've got to worry about this, this, this. We won't have the freedom. So why would anybody want to have a baby? Right? Questions at the front end. And then all of a sudden, you go to the doctor one day, and the doctor says, we're pregnant. Ten months, you're going to have a baby. And all of a sudden, those questions get a little bit tighter. And, and all of a sudden, you start thinking, you know, is this the right thing? Did we make the, you know, you know. And then the day of the birth of that child, it took you about three seconds to get over all those questions, didn't it? Mom, do you remember when they laid that baby on your stomach? Dad, do you remember the first time you held that little child, that miracle of God? All the questions ceased to exist, didn't they? At least for that moment. I mean, what happened? I'll tell you what happened. You fell in love with that child. And love makes the difference. There are some of you here today, and maybe you're in this category. You're single, divorced, single again. And you've already got the list why you don't want to get married. Some of you are trying to teach this list to your kids. <laughs> and at the next service, I'll be talking to our students, and, and one of their reasons would say, well, why would I want to get married? I've been watching my mom and dad too long. You know, they've got a real question mark there. You know, maybe th it's this one. Well, you know, I've seen my best friends get married, and I've seen what happens when you get married. Permanent restriction. 
why would I want to get married? That's a question right there on the, the front end. What about financial goals? You know, I, I want to be rich and I want to be successful. I'm going to go to college and I'm going to get my degree and I'm going to make money. But if I get married, it'll take me three or four times as long because I've got to get married and take care of a wife and husband and I've got to, you know, a kids. And he'll just, you know, why would I want to do that? Financial goals. What about this? I think I need to play the field. A lot of people out there, you know, a lot of new faces. Why would I want to get married? Maybe the last question might be, well, I'm too old or I'm too young to get married. And then you meet that person. And we all have if, if we're married. At least I hope this is true. Maybe I'm in dangerous waters. You meet that person that you fall in love with, and guess what? All of those questions go to the back of the car, don't they? None of those other questions really matter. You know why? Because love really does matter. It is the link to our lives. Well, today, as we deal with 316, and I'll explain that at the end of the series today, what that means. Uh, and I don't want you to ever forget it by the end of this. But today, we're going to deal with a guy that had questions. And I really believe if probably Jesus was here today, one of the visits he would make would be to the local church. And the reason he would visit the local church is because we're going to find a guy today that had questions. One of the most religious guys you could ever meet in your life. Billy Graham says, and this is just his opinion, but I kind of trust his wisdom. He thinks somewhere between 50 and 60% of the people who go to church every Sunday do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They have religion. If that's true, and I hope it's not, but if that is true, that means half the people I'm speaking to this morning might fit into the category of the guy we're going to talk about today. What's wrong with religion? If you have your Bibles, turn, if you will, to the book of John, John chapter 3. If you've been in church for any length of time, you know a little bit about this story. And uh, it's, a, it's a good story because it applies to a lot of us that are here. The next three weeks, we're going to be talking specifically about those people who probably don't come to church. So if you've got people you've been talking to, praying about, people who have said, you know, I don't believe in that, don't whatever, next three weeks would be a good time to invite somebody to come to church, okay? It is sp specifically designed to talk to them about their questions. Look beginning in John chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says there was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him at night and said, Rabbi... We know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. Jesus replied, I assure you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, to understand the context of this in chapter 3, you've got to go back to chapter 2. Chapter 2 is a very interesting chapter because there's two big things that happen in that chapter. At the beginning of John chapter 2, Jesus has been invited to a party, a wedding. And not all of us, usually, you know, those are nice things to go to and, and you enjoy them.